four o'clock. So we will get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for attending. We have a good number of our task forces present as well as a number of attendees. Thank you for participating at home. Uh, we are also streaming on Facebook right now and this meeting is being recorded uh, to be posted later on both YouTube and Facebook. So um, once again, I will mention that this we're holding this meeting in public. However, it is not a meeting of the school board or any board of the school board and therefore uh, while not subject to the right to know law, we're certainly treating it as such. Um, our agenda for today is to hear from our various subgroups that met over the course of the last week. Um, we will start with a medical and science committee update from Jim Manning. And uh, we'll then check in with Georgia Craven uh, on the student side, although I know she's still gathering uh, students as we speak. Um, a faculty and staff committee update from Stephen O'Keefe and Amy Facey. Uh, parents and community update from Shannon Gascoigne. Uh, statewide task force update from Michael Berry. I have some information from a parent and staff survey over the past week that we can share. And then Anna Perel and Bethany Bernasconi, which will probably take a majority of our time, will present their administrative update from their team that's met several times over the past week. Uh, the only decision I'd like us to try to attempt to make today is to, to see if we can come to resolution on whether an early start to the school year is a viable option. We've heard feedback from all of our subgroups about that, so we'll discuss that directly. And then I'd like to end by understanding whether our administrative options that our, our team has presented is an exhaustive list, if there's anything missing from that list, or if there's uh, uh, options from that list that we should consider eliminating before moving forward and continuing with our work. So that's our, our planned agenda. Again, I thank everyone for joining uh, via Zoom. Um, although inconvenient in some ways, it's pretty darn quick to join as well. And so that's not the worst thing in the world either. So. Um, I'm going to put in a plug for Sohegan High School's graduation tomorrow night, occurring uh, at Sohegan at 6.30. However, although it's not open to the public, uh, anyone is welcome to stream that event. It's going to be on both Facebook and on YouTube, and uh, will be recorded for posterity. And then there will be a parade afterwards. So uh, all of the graduates that choose to participate will have the chance to go on a parade through Amherst and end in the village on the green, and I encourage anyone from the community who cannot attend either because of limited tickets for graduates or just isn't able to come to please come and cheer on our seniors as they graduate. So I almost said as they pass on, but I think that has a different meaning if I say it that way. So no one's passing on tomorrow. Um, so uh, with that, Jim Manning, would you please give us an update on your science, medical and nurses group? Although I know uh, due to my error, you've not connected with the nurses quite yet, uh, but you will this coming week. So. Jim, an update. Yeah, that was the first thing I was going to ask you, Adam. So hold on one second here. Um, I'm just going to pull up. Uh, you just disable participant sharing. Can't share my screen. Are you able to now? Let me check. Hold on a second. There we go. All right, Adam, let me know if you, when you can see this. Got it. You got it? Okay. So I'm only, <clears throat> so, um, so I'll be brief. Um, the, um, the scientific or science committee, whatever you want to call it, we did meet this week. I am waiting to hear back. I think, Adam, you said there was a couple of school nurses who wanted to join. We had um, five people on the call, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of people could not make it and I was able to follow up with them on separate calls later in the week. But the subcommittee is um, Dr. Doug Allen, who's listed here, uh, Christine Disco, Jill McGregor, Heather Skelton, and Dr. John Vore. Um, we also had another member uh, who um, is a nurse, but um, she works in Massachusetts and she had some concerns about her um, uh, she had some concerns about um, her, her license is really to practice in Massachusetts. So she had some concerns about being part of the group. And of course, we'll add the, the two school nurses as well. So I'll, I'll review what we discussed on the slide. And then um, if there's anybody from the subcommittee who's also on the call today, 
certainly we'll turn it over to them and they can jump in and provide some, some additional color and information. So I'll start by saying that um, when, I, when I first met with Adam on what he really wanted from this subcommittee, and of course we had the discussion last week, he had clarified that the superintendent's goal or the SAU goal was to provide sources of credible scientific information upon which the full committee could rely and upon which we could base a, a decision on how, if or how or whatever to open the schools in the fall. So when we met, um, we, you know, we, we, we had a discussion around uh, the, how germane that, that goal actually was to this group and spent a lot of time talking about that. And the reason was basically because you know, if when you want to prevent, present credible scientific information, you want to have that scientific information be credible. And right now, there's so many unknowns relative to COVID-19, and I think Adam and I, we have talked about this, um, that it's difficult to pull together anything that is reliable or can be considered um, having established long-term best practice um, anywhere else at this point. Now, there are some best practices we can pull from from the state of New Hampshire and other areas, but it just got us talking and it's raised some questions. So you can see on the slide that the first, the first question was, is this goal the right one? And then there were a series of questions that followed from that. Um, one of them, and there was a lot of, there was a lot of discussion around, around this was, you know, as we go through this process, you know, it's going to be helpful to us to get a sense for, you know, what's the level of risk the community is willing to take in terms of how well we prepare a response for schools opening up in the fall. Um, that also led to other questions around what are the metrics we're going to use to tack or trigger when needed if, if an event occurs or if spread occurs in the schools. Which recommendations are we going to follow? They're going to be state, they're going to be national, they're going to be CDC. In many cases, those recommendations right now are not, they're not nationally codified. They can be different. Um, are we going to need to define and interpret those guidelines? So some of those guidelines, I think uh, the, the uh, education commissioner, Edelbutt, is going to, um, if he hasn't done so already, release some guidelines later this week. My sense is, is those guidelines are going to be fairly, um, fairly high level. So, you know, is this, is this subcommittee going to need to try to interpret those guidelines if there's not enough detail? And then lastly, you know, what are really the non-negotiables the community is going to need to follow if we're going to give a, a credible, um, if we're going to give credible guidance back to the community on reopening the schools? So from that, we, we came up with, with a new goal um, for this group, which is to provide a framework for reasonable precautions the SAU needs to take for the school to reopen in the fall. So I'll, I'll list these and then I'll stop for questions and then additional comments from other members of the subcommittee. But those, those things fell into three big areas uh, or three main areas. The first one is mitigation. So what steps and plans do we need to put in place to mitigate spread if the schools reopen in the fall and the kids are back in the classroom, physically back in the classroom? Um, monitoring. What metrics are we going to use to serve as a trigger if there's if spread occurs, we identify spread occurs, or how are we going to identify that? So monitoring is the second one. The last one is response. What is the sequence of actions we're going to take given any potential outcomes um, that happen within the school during the time period where the kids are the kids are present? So uh, we are we're going to after this call we're going to set up um, additional phone calls for us to get on the line and start to flesh out these three areas. But we felt like we wanted to stop here um, and make sure the community was okay with the change in goal, the superintendent was okay with the change in goal, and that the three big areas that we had identified are directionally headed in the, in, in the right place. So let me stop there. If there's anybody else from the subcommittee as well, if you, if you have anything you wanna add or clarify, given what I've just outlined. Questions or comments from the group or from any of our attendees? No questions are coming through yet, Jim. So Jim, so Jim, what you're saying is you're putting a focus on reopening in the fall and what do we have to do with, within an acceptable level of risk to our community? Is that, a, is that a very boiled down way of saying what you're suggesting to us? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we. 
that, that's, that's basically what we're saying that the most risk to the community is posed by reopening the schools, having the students physically back in the classroom, right? So if that occurs, what level of risk are we comfortable with? And what we mean by that is, is that it's, it's, very, it's highly uh, unrealistic to expect that we can put together a framework that's going to have zero cases of COVID-19 in the high school because your population in the high school or the elementary school or whatever school you're talking about in SAU 39, that you're going to see the same you're going to see the same thing in that population, that subpopulation as you have in a larger population in the state. So to have zero risk in the schools is not something that we feel is going to be attainable. So is the community okay with that? So if they're okay with that and we, we allow the kids to get back in the classroom and there's some risk, right? Um, knowing that, knowing that the, uh, um, you know, knowing that there's not a lot of there's not a lot of people under the age of 18 who who are hospitalized for this disease in the state of New Hampshire, but knowing that there are the risk is is the spread, right? The spread of the disease. So what do you need to do to do that? And the three things we feel like we would need to do are mitigation, monitoring, and then an appropriate response or subsequent action, something of that nature. Great. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Jim? And again, the, the school nurses are going to be connected with Dr. LeBranch, she'll be next. Um, the school nurses will be uh, meeting with Jim this past this next week. Um, I, it was an error on my part not connecting him with Jim this past week, but they need to connect with him as well. But uh, Dr. LeBranch. Uh, Jim, uh, looking at uh, number two, the monitoring, where you've indicated um, need to identify the metrics that are going to be used. Now I'm assuming that's where you're going to roll in the, the uh, scientific data that was in the original uh, cha uh, charge that was given by Adam. Um, I think most of us may have read the um, editorial that was in the union leader uh, this, this week from the uh, president of the New Hampshire Pediatrics Group where he talked about uh, the infection rate, you know, at the elementary level, uh, the potential is something like 1.2% uh, for those, uh, for that group of uh, children. Um, so I guess I'm assuming that those kinds of metrics would be uh, used in the monitoring at some point in time, you know, where, where do you hit that particular benchmark? And then you have to obviously get into the response phase. Yeah, I mean, I think when we, I think that it's, it's right now, it's, it's open to debate among the group of what those metrics look like. So like the state of New Hampshire, they use the R-naught to determine, you know, once you get to an R-naught of one or below one, then you, you feel comfortable in opening things back up. Um, Jim, explain the R-naught metric. I'm sorry, stop right there if you could, R-naught. Yeah, it's just, it's just like, uh, in like layman's terms, it's just the, the, um, you know, when you start, when you start, it's it's really it's it's a way to define spread. It's a statistical way to define spread. So it's it's going beyond spreading from one person to another one person. It's going to spread from one person to multiple, branching out to multiple people. So once you get the the spread down one to one or below one to one, then then um, you can control the spread more effectively. We're, I don't I don't know. I, we don't reasonably know yet, or I don't know from the conversations we have what our ability to do measure something like that will be within within a micro environment like SAU 39. So we're gonna to have to talk about what those metrics might be, but we're gonna to have to measure something though. Um, Dr. Allen is the um, chief of anesthesiology up in CMC and was, uh, I don't think he's on the call right now, but he was, um, he's worked on the, the committee up there to, uh, on the COVID response team up at CMC. So there's some things they measure within that environment you know, maybe we can pull down into into a school-based environment, um, but we we're not prepared to talk about specifically what those things are today. We we actually wanted to stay away from it today, right now. So we circle the wagons a little bit more. Other questions from the panelists from the task force. can use your raise hand feature or just wave at me. I can't see all of you at the same time, so I may not, I may miss you if you wave at me. But, and for, again, for those who are attendees, if you can use the Q&A function to send us your question, that way everyone can see the response and we can all answer them for you. 
Okay, so Jim, next steps for your subcommittee would be to connect with our school nurses and wrap them into the conversation. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, from at least from my perspective, what I hear you saying is that we should not expect that if we open school in the fall uh, to have no cases of COVID-19 exist in our school community. Is that? Well, I think, I think rather it is, is, it's an unrealistic goal to have none, okay. right? Is it probably a better way to say it? Um, so we have to be, at least the, the opinions, and I would strongly say opinions of the subcommittee is that would, that would be an unrealistic goal to have no cases. So if you, if you, you feel like you're not gonna have any cases then you wanna be prepared that you're going to have some and how you're gonna respond. All right, very good. Thank you, Jim, for that, uh, very yep. helpful. Um, next, Georgia Craven, our student uh, subgroup chairperson is going to give us an update from the student side, Georgia. All right, so um, I've started the process of how I'm gonna get input from students. And so I've decided that I'm gonna do three Zoom calls. Um, one's going to be with my high school group and I have over 30 kids who want in on that. So um, that's going to be a discussion. And I've come up with about seven questions. Um, and these are all complete, like rough drafts. So if anybody has other ideas or wants to tweak them, that'd be great. I definitely need um, input on those. But I'm going to send that out in a Google Doc as well. So they can fill that out and email it to me. But I'm going to try to take notes in the Zoom meeting as well. So I'm gonna have them answer those questions in the Zoom meeting and then give time for any extra input, anything I didn't cover in the questions. Um, and so that's for high school. The upper middle school, I'm also gonna include these questions for them, but um, also kind of be like more of just, what are your thoughts right now? Like, what are your feelings and stuff like that? Um, Cause some of the younger kids aren't gonna really understand as much as maybe the kids in high school will. So. Um, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read out the questions. And then if you guys have any tweaks or any other questions I could do, um, just feel free to message me. I don't need to take up any more time. But um, so my first one is, what are your concerns about going back? Just I want to hear what what are you concerned about? What are you worried about? Um, and then what are your concerns about not going back? Are there problems at home that or uh, your parents are working, something like that? Um, what are some ways we could go back safely? Just, I just want to hear their ideas. Um, any, anything is going to help us in this case. Um, are there ways to participate in sports or, or extracurriculars, even if we're learning remotely? So that's been a big concern about um, through my peers that I've heard uh, is that like they're going crazy without extracurriculars or sports. And that's an outlet for a lot of people's health and um, well-being. So I'm going to ask about that as well um and we might be able to stay in smaller groups that way so hopefully there's some cool ideas about that um how important is it that we attend school in person in the fall to you individually um and how important is it to you that we stay socially distant but still in person in the fall would you prefer to have a choice of either remote learning or in-person learning and would you still enjoy going back to school if we had split days or split weeks where half of the school comes on one day and the other half comes on another? Um, and so those are just a few. I try not to make them very biased, but um, they might be. So please let me know if you think they are, if I should add something else or take something out. Um, and then for the younger kids, uh, like I want, I have a few elementary school, upper elementary school. Um, so if any teachers or parents that are listening right now have younger kids they want to get involved, um, just send me their name or uh, parent contact info so I can set up a Zoom for them. Um, but just that would be more like feelings and how you're doing with remote learning and stuff like that. But that's all I have so far. The Zoom calls are going to be uh, at the beginning of next week. Excellent. That sounds like a great plan, Georgia. Any questions for Georgia? Uh, Shannon Gascoigne. Thanks, Georgia. I really like the model that you're that you're using. We're doing a similar approach with uh, parents and community members, so that's really great. I'm wondering if for the um, some of the younger kids, or or just maybe some of the kids who may not be as comfortable to share their feelings in in a Zoom, if maybe there's a questionnaire or something that their parents could 
submit, you know, on their behalf for you, if anyone's interested in that? Yeah, I did think about that. And um, the one, the one thing uh, that's really important to me is that I'm hearing students' voices and not parents' voices because a lot of parents are going to have their own thoughts about this and I don't want to like we want the parent info but I don't want to hear the parent info I want to hear the children's info so um, that was a one thing I know with younger kids I have to involve the parents as um, you know that's part of being a child so but um, hopefully that's why the zoom it's like i'm hearing their voices but maybe i'll do something where it's like you can send in your kids uh thoughts about this and i i'll probably be able to tell if it's what they actually said or if the parent of it so um we'll see <laughs> i i will definitely try to do something for kids who aren't comfortable um in a zoom whether it's a questionnaire or just like a little thought bubble send me what you're thinking kind of thing any other comments or questions for Georgia? All right, Stephen O'Keefe and Amy Facey are chairing our subgroup that is working with our teachers and our uh, various labor groups. An update, Stephen. Great, thank you, Adam. I'm gonna share my screen here in terms of a, uh, uh, a quick uh, sort of PowerPoint that we uh, put together for um, just uh, a quick presentation today. Can you see that, Adam? Is that uh, popping up on the screen for you? Perfect. So we actually took our meeting and we uh, basically divided up into really four uh, different uh, different segments. And we wanted to pose these four questions to folks to not only look back, but start the, the process of looking back to map the, the, the path going forward. And we divided those questions up into remote learning, an early start, whether or not it's uh, possible or feasible or what some of the challenges we may encounter in that, uh, in that environment, tools and resources that we wish we had. Uh, and more importantly, what we want to have if we move into the fall and we need to transition into some uh, uh, some things that we need to um, uh, modify our, our daily course of uh, normalcy. Uh, and last but not least, and, and from my perspective, probably the most important is the life-work balance, right? The stress that, that may fall upon uh, our, our various staff members. And so when we went ahead and we actually jumped directly into the first piece is the looking back pieces, you know, the pros and cons, what worked and, and what didn't. And what we found, when we take a look at uh, the stuff that actually worked, our faculty, our staff, our employees, they literally jumped in with four days notice. And you really, like, you couldn't even imagine that two years ago that people would be able to completely take their job and, and, and change it 360 degrees and, and expect that they're going to operate at the, the high level of achievement that we actually did. So we did awesome work there. Uh, and the community, I, I think, as a board member and as a community member, as a parent, uh, I know I appreciated my teachers significantly. And, you know, I think the community definitely recognized that work and, and that effort. Uh, and, and all the stuff that went in behind the scenes. Uh, as you can see here, just a couple more quick uh, uh, bullet points that, that some of the feedback you received from, um, from some of the, the stakeholders at, at our session uh, and making sure that uh, you know, we, we, we map out that, that, that positive sort of approach. One commonality that actually approached on the other side that also came on the stuff that didn't work, as you can see here, the flex day component. You know, possibly implementing a flex day uh, at all grade levels if we have to go remote again, just giving the capacity from a emotional behavioral standpoint, from a, a teacher's, uh, uh, you know, mental health standpoint, just to put in a, a flex day in there that we can go ahead and either get caught up, uh, create new lesson plans, uh, revisit with students that may be uh, a little bit behind. And we can see also a couple of other things that, uh, uh, you know, were, were not necessarily out, uh, outstanding you know, equitable uh, ex expectations for each grade level, making sure there's some commonalities across uh, our, our various schools with inside the district. Streamline approach for families and students, uh, creating that with ease, just to make sure that they logged in, they know exactly where to go. Those are some of the things that we're gonna wanna uh, think about and how we implement uh, as we move into, uh, into the fall with a potential remote, re uh, remote environment. Uh, I did upload, by the way, the link directly to the Trello board. So if someone wants to visit this uh, later on, they're gonna have that capacity. The, the next question that we actually posed is, you know, can we start early? Is mid-August even possible? 
and and to be honest with you, the resounding impacts to that, unfortunately, were there's going to be a lot of challenges, a lot of barriers that are going to actually uh, be thrown our way if we do uh, try to, uh, to to start the school year uh, uh, in, in in an early fashion. Not only from the faculty and staff standpoint, but the impression that students would be able to have parents cancel vacations at the last minute, and obviously no one's traveling uh, overseas or uh, on airplanes with any great degree of frequency, but you know, if we've got a lake house that's rented for the second week of August, you know, we, uh, we're, 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 we're actually wishing that we can probably get away and get out of our home. So it's going to be definitely uh, some significant challenges there. Uh, and then more importantly, what's going on in other districts, right? So we're going to have employees that uh, having their kids start on time, and then we're expecting them to, to head into the buildings a little bit early uh, than, than, than they normally would have. Uh, and of course, just the, the environmental side. Going outside in the summer sounds awesome, but uh, the resources and tools that you would need to have an effective learning environment outside uh, are definitely going to be challenged, not only from an air conditioning standpoint, a sun standpoint, just the distractions that little kids may, uh, may encounter there. So uh, the overwhelming consensus was there's definitely going to be a lot of challenges on the early start side. Uh, next, we went into the tools and resources. You know, what are some of the things that we wish we had as we actually started this overall process? And one common sort of thought uh, amongst all the participants uh, were, you know, just uniformity. Uniformity in the tools that we were leveraging. Uh, high school were using different tools than our elementary schools were using. Um, parents had different kids with different tools. You know, one was using Google Classroom. Uh, maybe another teacher was using something a little bit different. So trying to come up with some consistency there. So uh, if a parent had multiple kids in different districts, uh, they would create some commonalities there and, and, and just a much more easier uh, transition. Um, Zoom was a huge, huge uh, addition, but coming up with ways from a training standpoint how to better control that platform. Um, there were some uh, faculty members that expressed some concerns uh, about some of the things that other students were able to view on that, that uh, clearly something that we would need to address. Uh, and then of course our arts, right? So how do we go ahead and deliver content in our, whether or not our art classes or music classes, all the various things that uh, exist with outside the math or the STEAM uh, type programs. How do we go ahead and actually implement that in, in a uh, resounding impactful way? So those are the things that of course we need to, uh, uh, to, 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 to do. Uh, and then of course, uh, moving over into the life work balance piece, that's the last. And from my perspective, the, the, the most important for our employees is just to really hone in and focus in and come up with um, whether it be outside uh, assistance from a, a EAP standpoint, an employee mental health standpoint, making sure that uh, administrators are checking in with uh, faculty members on an ongoing basis. Are they overwhelmed? Uh, administrators stepping in when uh, maybe parents are exceeding the, the normalcy of contacts, uh, you know, 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, just having administrators step in and create some structure to, to, to that type of relationship especially at the beginning, just creating norms, right? Clear expectations, setting that stuff, strong guidelines uh, and, and making sure that our, our employees feel uh, not only valued, but uh, uh, as a successful member of our team. Um, Amy, I just went through that really, really fast. Anything that you wanted to add? Not really, that was pretty comprehensive, Stephen. Um, but I would, I would um, emphasize that the message that came through loud and clear was that folks were looking for consistency, norms, guidelines. Um, that theme really wove through all of the different topics that we spoke about. Um, and I, I would also say that I was, um, I was struck that there was a lot of consensus around what the issues were uh, what folks had for issues and what they perceived to be the um, the items that we're going to need to overcome in order to deliver um, education in the fall. So it was it was a really good and rich conversation with everybody, um, and I look forward to our next meeting uh, to dive deeper into our next topics. Yeah, so Did our you next topics. Did mention those? <laughs> just about to go there. Yeah, Thank you. So right. the next topics we're going to cover, we're going to spend a lot of time in special education, special education delivery. Uh, the pain points, things that we need to uh, really focus on. Uh, we talked about the hybrid model, a combination of both um, students coming in and at the same time having students working uh, uh, remotely from home, the challenges that we uh, may need to, to address there. And more importantly, what a school like from an employee standpoint, what a school look like in September? Um, from a temperature uh, checking standpoint that Jim Manning's team is going to be looking at uh, to, you know, I've got students that are now in all corners and how do we go ahead and leverage uh, the, the, the board to make sure everybody can see it and, 
you know, all the things that we're going to be sharing supplies. What does that physically look like and where are the challenges and pain points that we can expect uh, there? So those are the things we're going to work on uh, this upcoming Monday and uh, we look forward to it. It's going to be an awesome conversation. So before I open it up for questions from the group, uh, hearing your feedback, um, one the reason I put it on the agenda later is our discussion about an early start is it, it sounds to be a non-starter for the labor side uh, of the equation. Um, I, I heard that correctly. Is that right, Stephen? Yeah, there's there's just a lot of uh, significant hills that we're going to need to overcome uh, and if we were to even entertain that. Uh, there were some positives, right? So the positives were we're going to be able to, 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 to get started and, and create that ongoing learning environment, uh, but the, the negatives were far overwhelming any, any positives that were mentioned. Okay. At the risk of, of saying something scary, the, I think we do need to keep in mind that if this becomes a cyclical yearly thing that we have every November, a large wave of COVID-19 issues that result in us having to close school every November, we're gonna have to think about our school calendar in a different way moving forward. That's my uh, thing that I think we need to chew on, but luckily that's not part of our scope <laughs> right now. It's something we ought to think about. Um, questions from the group for Stephen or Amy? So Adam, this is George. I have a question. Yes, George. I'm sorry I didn't um, see your hand raised. Thank you for raising your hand. No, I didn't see it. Sorry. Yeah, that always happened to me in third grade too. <laughs> um, as I was listening to the to the outline of the various options that are available for structure for return, uh, my question would be: um, How do you plan to assess, much less quantify, the risk benefit of each one of those? Yeah, that, that, that really is the, uh, the question. So George, if I could um, ask you to pause that question until after our administrative team updates in just a few minutes, um, because that's, I think that's a very germane discussion for that, if that's all right with you. Any other questions from the group for Stephen or Amy? Okay. Um, our next update is the parents and community update from Shannon Gascoigne. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Adam. So um, first, I just want to start off by saying that we have a really uh, fantastic, committed, and really conscientious group of um, parents and caregivers and community members who have signed up. I think by Saturday morning, we were up to uh, 51. Um, folks who had who had uh, signed up so um, sent out an initial questionnaire to folks kind of like what Georgia is planning to do just to get some uh, baseline um, information make certain we have a good representation in the subgroup um, so I'm really happy to report that we do and I've shared um, the particulars of those questionnaires with each of the committee chairs and then I just have some slides to share today um, that kind of highlight some of it for the uh, for the community who are watching right now. In addition to the questionnaire um, that went out to these folks, um, I also offered two uh, Zoom meetings on Monday and Tuesday. So Monday evening, 24 parents and community members signed on for that. We spent about an hour and a half focused on two themes. Uh, first, we started with um, reflections on experience with the spring closure and distance learning. And then the next theme that we focused on was uh, fall expectations. What do what do parents expect? What are they looking for um, when it comes to the fall? Um, and a couple of folks, um, George was, was on the call, Peter was on the call, so feel free to jump in if I miss anything. Um, but I'll start just going through the slideshow real quick. Um, your screen. Adam, would you mind to take us through? Yeah, so just a little um, information about the parents in the group. We have a pretty good spread um, of folks representing elementary, middle, and high school. So I was pleased to see that. Um, the next question, um, I asked for just some household information to get an idea of what type of students are in the home and, and what the family um, is experiencing that may be relevant to you all. Um, and that's, this is sort of where we landed there. So a good amount of folks um, kind of across the board with sports, clubs, okay. uh, supports at schools, things like that. Um, 
asked for overall um, rating of experience with distance learning. And this was a one to five scale with one being poor and five being excellent. Um, so overall and overwhelmingly, I can also share in the um, focus groups as well, um, you know, the, the, the thread was the same. Folks were just really impressed with how quickly the SAU was able to kind of turn and um, roll out the distance learning. Um, so, so that was great. I think um, those efforts were, were really good and, and recognized. Um, the next question in the initial questionnaire um, talked about um, the highlight of your experience. So this um, kind of, um, I think is really, again, really nice feedback for the SAU overall approach was, was really um, a highlight for a lot of folks along with the, the teacher engagement. And then just to kind of get a, this is a really basic baseline question, just to kind of get a sense of, of what people are, are thinking about, hearing about, and, and to Jim's point um, earlier, there's, there's just a lot of information out there. Um, and that was really evident in talking with folks in the focus groups. Um, uh, so that was interesting. Uh, largest concern with distance learning overall, and, and I heard this numerous times in the focus group calls as well, um, folks are just really concerned about the, the social and um, uh, mental uh, uh, health impacts for their kids. Um, the lack of social interaction was, was really hard, um, not surprisingly. So another question that we asked, and there were many answers, and I just plucked a few to share. Um, Adam had asked last week that he would be interested in task uh, impressions of the task force. So um, the community really appreciates having a voice. Um, they are, again, really concerned with the social emotional um, well-being and any decisions that are made um, and really impressed with the, the well-rounded group of folks on, on the task force. So that was positive. Um, so it was, <laughs> there were, I had a couple of folks who agreed to take notes during the meeting. I'm very grateful to them. Um, there were pages and on pages of, of notes that came out of these hour and a half long sessions. Um, but these are just some of the highlights. So overall reflections on distance uh, learning, again, SE39 did a great job rolling it out. We had many districts. Um, and I'll note that we also had uh, parents on the call who work in other school districts. So they also had some really positive feedback for their experience as a parent, um, which was great. The teachers went above and beyond. It really felt like the decisions were being made um, based on the health and safety of our community. Um, I kind of tried to break up some of the comments, high school, middle, elementary school, because they were kind of different depending on, on the situation. So um, the high school parents really felt like they had um, expectations established up front. They liked the required Zoom logins. Um, they were concerned that over time, a loss of rigor um, was starting to occur. Um, their students missed the social interaction. It's really difficult to teach sciences in an online environment. Um, some concern over the uh, competency-based um, education model in an online world. Um, some concern with ending the year early, that was difficult in some of the more advanced level classes. Um, and they would love to see resources for parents moving forward. Uh, middle school, um, they missed being at the school for their special services. They found that any small session was more meaningful and that, that was sort of across the board. Um, they felt like it started off really well, um, but as, as it had to continue on, they would have liked to see more structure. They like the anchoring adult program, um, but they would like to see a more consistent experience. So among the group, folks just felt like it kind of depended on who the anchoring adult was, but they really like the idea of, of that, especially if we have to continue in any sort of distance environment moving forward. Um, just again, more consistent experience and, and expectation setting. Um, they didn't find the videos as helpful for their students um, as they did the live Zoom session. So anytime a student could be in a live meeting with the teacher, that was, that was their more meaningful time. At the elementary school, again, structure and small groups provided the best experience. Um, parents of younger children uh, struggled with the amount of screen time, um, didn't translate well to pre-K. And again, uh, I really wanna reiterate that all of, the, all of these comments were 
um, given in, um, uh, with saying like, they did a great job, but you know, if we, if we, you know, here's how we could make it better. Um, specialist time was really valuable and frequent at the elementary level. Um, the students though, because of their age, they needed a lot of help um, navigating the technology. Um, the younger children were really hard to, to keep focused when they did have the Zoom, they were moving around. I'm sure the teachers know, know this very well. Um, and they felt like, you know, overall it was, it was adequate for, for what, what we needed in the spring. Moving forward to fall, um, it was really interesting. Um, initially, overwhelmingly, people were like, we want our kids to be back at school. When you kind of start to dr drill down what school looks like, started to vary a little bit. Um, uh, so that's where I'm hoping to have more conversations with folks with guided questions from all of your subgroups um, to help them. Working parents really, you know, they need their kids back in school. They're pretty clear about that. If they're going back to work, they would really like to see their kids back in school. Um, a plan for creating a distance learning system that addresses some of the gaps. Um, everyone felt pretty strongly that it's not if we're going to need distance learning again, it's when. Um, and so to really build that up into a really robust um, tool and, and to really talk about what worked and what didn't in the spring was valuable for parents. Um, they didn't think that a split schedule was going to work. So split schedule being like um, A day, B day, or half the kids go for part of the week, it just didn't work for many families for many reasons. Um, but they liked the idea of a face-to-face -face option for families um, and teachers that that would work for and um, a distance-based option for families and teachers who needed that. Um, I don't, you know, there's obviously a lot of questions that would, would need to go into that. Um, social distancing measures in school, um, many parents just felt like that was going to be very difficult to implement. Um, and, and what would that mean for their students' time while they're in the school building? Um, and again, that question about, you know, what's more important to parents. Overwhelmingly, they want their kids to be able to wash their hands and, and take some precautions, but they didn't seem to feel that, you know, there was uh, realistically keeping a mask on and staying six feet away from, from others was going to, to be possible. Um, it was suggested that maybe we could create a dashboard for monitoring illness that could be shared um, with the community. Um, we need a plan. Overwhelmingly, parents want a plan that addresses keeping students and our community healthy. And as you know, this is a fluid situation. What's the plan? It, you know, if if we're under quarantine again, you know, how can we how can we deal with that? Um, it was also recommended that we consider teaching a course to students, an age appropriate course at the start of school, on um, viral and disease transmission. So you know, how how can we talk to kids in a way that they can hear about you know being safe? Um, that my last slide? That was your last slide, yes. That was my last slide, okay. Some other things that, that came up numerous times, um, air quality uh, was mentioned. So how can we get folks outside? How can we keep air moving through the building? Um, one parent suggested um, UV air filters in every room. Um, and again, going back to how can we get the kids in school and put them in an environment that's really, um, you know, as healthy and safe as possible. And there were many things <laughs> discussed. These are really just the highlights and, and places where we saw themes. So if there are any other questions or um, for me, please, please ask. And I would love some guidance from the group. Again, this is a really committed and engaged community, which is awesome. Um, and I would love to have some more sessions with those folks asking the questions that, um, that will best help support each of, of your subgroups. Thank you, Shannon. Questions for Shannon? Uh, I found that really helpful. Um, I think the idea of a dashboard for the public to see what is what is illness level look like in our school today, this week, what have you. That's a in particular. I think that's a great idea. I pulled a lot from that. That and that's one thing for sure that really rose to the top for me. Anybody else with questions or thoughts? All right, we're moving right along. These are great. Uh, Mike Berry, if you would um, provide us an update from the statewide task force. And I'm gonna ask you if you could to share a statement that was provided to you from that task force that's pretty on point for our role as a local task force. Mike. Uh, 
I'll start off by, by reading that verbatim and then I'll just kind of give you an update where that where we're at in the process. But the statement that came out, and some people might have seen this, shared on the commissioner's statewide call on uh, the other afternoon, there will not be a statewide reopening plan, quote unquote. Those decisions reside at the local level and plans should look different by community and county based on the unique circumstances of the locality. The New Hampshire Department of Education will issue guidance and is available for support. If any restrictions emerge on the reopening of schools, they are established through the governor's executive orders and DHHS regulations. The full school reopening and redesign task force meets next Tuesday at 10 a.m. So that was the update that came out of the commissioner the other day. Um, I can tell you that the subcommittee work is complete. Uh, we've had a uh, uh, number of the committees went and instead of having three meetings, they went on and had four, five meetings uh, to finish the work and, and what each subcommittee of the overall task force worked on was kind of like analyzing the re potential recommendations that will be given you know, as an overall report. Um, and so the group that's facilitating the meeting has done a lot of the legwork to help kind of move this process along really fast. Uh, the meetings are well attended. A lot of the conversation that is happening looks very similar to the conversation that is happening on this call. You know, they're, they're, the topics are, are very similar. The, the thoughts and the concerns are, are on point. There's no kind of like hidden room with other knowledge that's out there. Uh, so. I think you guys have a lot of the right information. So expect next week and, and moving forward into the uh, the end of the month that some general recommendations and guidance will be given to uh, school districts. And then hopefully, you know, after the 4th of July, school districts will have the information from the DOE and then we'll be able to make some of those plans into action for their uh, for their districts and schools. The interesting piece that's kind of come out over the last couple weeks was this statement that it's it's going to be different by county and, 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 and community. And uh, people were at least looking for some universal plan to keep it as equitable as we can, but that's not going to be reality based on the input from the medical community. Thanks, Mike. Question. <clears throat> yeah, Mike, did they give a rationale for why? And I, I understand that, um, you know, there's actually a lot of benefits by dealing with this at a more local level, but then there's obviously some drawbacks when you don't have a lot of top-down uh, coordination, let's call it. So did they give a rationale for not providing that? And was it a, was it a clinical one? No, not yet. I'm, I'm anticipating and expecting that will be rolled out uh, when some of the higher ups get on the calls. Right now, it's kind of at a subcommittee level, so so we haven't been privy to that information. But I'm anticipating that in, that coming maybe on the 23rd or the 29th as we get into this a little bit more. The agenda hasn't been released for the 23rd as well. So if 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 it was a topic, I would tell you it, but I haven't heard that yet. Okay, because I'm just like concerned, like just logistical things like NHI AA schedules and busing when you two districts share buses if you've got two different start times and I mean it could be it could be a logistical nightmare in certain parts of the state so I'm just wanting to make sure that they they hear that yeah that is definitely some of the the more lengthy conversations have to de deal with uh, special ed transportation and athletics and co-curriculars that's where it's kind of getting and then if you talk about meals as well for different parts of, of, of the state. And uh, so some of those things that go along with school are, are going to be some of the areas that they're grappling with and, and trying to give out a, a, some guidance. But I just don't look for um, it completely the same across the state of New Hampshire as people went into this process looking for. I don't think that's going to be an end outcome. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Yeah, the, 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 to add to what Mike is saying, the commissioner has stated to all of the superintendents in the state on numerous occasions that the DOE has no authority to tell a local school district whether to open, close, restrict access to students or any of those things. It's all uh, protected decisions at the local level. 
um, and therefore we're on our own to make them. If you remember when we all went out in March, some of us had already closed before the governor had announced that we were going to close. Um, and so short of an executive order from the governor or a health order from the DHHS, the DOE doesn't have the authority to tell us to close school or to open school. Uh, any other questions for Mike? Mike, thank you. Having you on that committee is uh, very helpful. Um, next, we have an update from me about the data um, related to our survey that we put out last week. So uh, let me share my screen. We received another uh, 1,200 or so responses, and I will uh, provide a summary on, on those here. So these are the, I know this is, uh, this isn't very um, easy to, to read. It's not a chart, but um, so this is first parents, May and June by school. If you had to choose today, would you send your kid to school? If social distancing wasn't fully possible, but we took reasonable precautions. So just to break this down, in May, 62% of parents at Clark Wilkins said yes. In June, it went up to 72%. So there was a change of 10% higher, uh, you know, higher, better, whatever you want to say. Mount Vernon Village School went from 64% to 69%, AMS 62 to 68, and Sohegan 71 to 76. You can see we had 1,262 responses, so 300 more responses than we had just a month ago. On the staff side, uh, for same school, let me hide this. Uh, staff, all schools um, went up in terms of the comfort level of our staff, some marginally, some more than others. Um, AMS in particular went up 17%, which was a big jump, and we had over 100 more staff respond to the survey this time. 259 staff responded to the survey, which is more than we had last time. You'll remember that we also asked the question, if you answered the survey the last time, has your comfort level gone up, gone down, or stayed the same? And so uh, 1,262 responses to that question and fully a third of people were more comfortable with my child returning to school than they were a month ago. 25% um, it was their first time taking the survey. 37% felt the same. And there was a small number of people, less than 4%, that felt less comfortable with their child returning to school. So the, the, the data matches the, this question in that there, are, there seems to be a rise, there was a rise between May and June in the comfort level of parents with the return to school, um, did not ask the same question of our staff. Uh, and so that's the survey data. And I've included that, that there's a link in our Trello board to that live data. If you wanna dive more deeply into the data, you can certainly do that. But any, any questions about that? Okay, hearing none. So the, the bulk of our meeting, uh, and we do have a hard stop at about 7.45, uh, 5.45 because uh, yeah, a really hard stop at 7.45. But at 5.45, we have a hard stop because several of us have another meeting tonight, the Joint Facilities Advisory Committee, which anybody here is welcome to join that as well. But we will have to stop and transition to that meeting. But the bulk of our meeting will be a discussion from the admin team. Uh, if you'll remember, we charged them with brainstorming all of the potential modalities for school in the fall. Uh, they've done that. They've had several meetings uh, this past week and have created what they believe to be an exhaustive list. And I asked them to, I can't remember if the committee or just I asked them to narrow it down um, to three or four options that we should consider as a task force moving forward. So uh, they're gonna walk us through that tonight. Um, this is pretty detailed information. It's going to be shared in the Trello board as well for people to dive more deeply into. Uh, our goal tonight is not to make a decision about the fall. Our goal is to start setting guideposts about where we're gonna spend our time investigating options, uh, if that makes sense to everybody. So uh, Anna Peril and Bethany Bernasconi are going to lead us in this discussion and I turn it over to them. So Anna. Thanks Adam. I think um, yeah, Bethany is going to, so Bethany and I are both gonna um, present tonight. And as Adam said, you know, our task was to take a look at every single potential modality to reopen school. Um, and with each option, um, the pros and cons. Our 
subcommittee is made up of 15 members um, and they range from every single uh, school, leadership from every single school and senior leadership from central office. Um, also, after we meet, each uh, principal is then asked to go back to their building level leadership teams and seek um, feedback from everybody on their teams. So uh, all voices uh, definitely are heard and are, um, those voices are brought to the table. Tonight, uh, we are presenting the, what we, as Adam said, uh, an exhaustive uh, 14 options that we came up um, that um, we, we are considering anywhere from the most in-person to uh, the most um, uh, remote options. So uh, with that next slide, just in case anybody um, in, in front of us or anybody at, at home that can't see, I'm just going to uh, read over each of the 14 options. Op and, and please know that these options are not given to you in any order. Uh, the first option, we would go fully remote until X date, whatever date that that would be, then we would go to a hybrid model based on the current data. Number two, we would go in person keeping K-8 cohorts together. Option three, we would split an AM and PM shift. Option four, we would do Anna, an a, yeah. Anna, can, I, can I just stop you for, I, yeah. um, some folks may not know what you mean when you say keeping cohorts together. Can you just define that term in option two? Right, that uh, the, the students would stay and move about their day together. They would not mix. And especially like we're saying here, K-8, uh, a sixth grade group would move together. There wouldn't be intermixing uh, throughout the day. And how we can confine that can go from uh, anywhere from um, staying lunches in the classroom to uh, going to PE together or not going to PE. So, but the, that can, confinement can, can flex, but that those groups of individuals would stay together. All right, so I think back to option four, it would be an A, B every other day. Half the kids would come one day, half the kids would come to the, the other. Option five would be going year round. Uh, so that's 45 days on, 15 days off. Uh, option six, full in-person with remote parent opt-in. Seven, there would be uh, uh, an A, an A, B schedule, but if I'm on like an A track, I would go to school two days. There would be a Wednesday professional development day, and then Thursday, Friday, I would go remote, and then B would do the opposite. Number eight, we would do an A week, and then a B week. Uh, option nine would be, there would be remote learning for grades seven through 12, and in-person K-6. Option 10 would be just a little twist on that. It would be remote 9-12 and in-person K-8, so just the high school. Option 11, full remote with in-person subgroups. So that could be special ed, that could be uh, somebody asked in the chat about social emotional needs. So full remote with the option of some subgroups being able to come into the building. Option 12, full remote, K-12. Option 13, uh, start early in August, and then you have a break somewhere for Thanksgiving until New, New Year's. Uh, those dates, obviously flexible. And um, option 14, it would be in person, but it's core content only. So kind of more restrictive to the earlier one that we talked about. So there would be no going to no going to specials, no, it would just be uh, uh, the, the English language arts, the math, science, social studies, so there would not be any other, it would just be in person for core content only. So with that, I'm going to turn the next slide over to Bethany. So um, what our group did is we went through each of these and really broke out the pros and cons for every single one of these um, different, different modalities. Uh, really tried to do an exhaustive list and worked really hard to not get down in the weeds of logistics, but really look at um, what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks to each of these different models. 
Um, and then after, after the exhaustive lists were put together, which we won't share during our time now, but we're happy to share out those exhaustive lists of pros and cons for anyone who wants to dig into all the details on all the options. Um, but we really needed some guiding principles um, to um, help us make some considerations. So uh, we thought hard about what are the values and priorities of our community, of our community of learners, of our students, our staff, our faculty, all of the above to really figure out like, how do we start to narrow this down? Um, because there are a lot of different options. So um, in no particular order, these are the, um, th this was our North Star. These were our guiding principles. And each of the um, modalities that we came up with and are about to present to you in more detail um, contain these considerations, but to varying degrees in each, right? It's not equal across every single one. So we really wanted to make sure that um, we're here to meet the needs of our families and our students. So that was the really support of our families. Um, implementation of instruction and curriculum, making sure that that's done with fidelity, that we both support student growth, but we also close any learning gaps that have occurred. Um, an equity of experience and access um, so that students are getting what they need based on what they need and what that criteria is. Um, ensuring the health and safety of all our staff, um, our students, and really that extends to the larger community that we serve and what are our available resources. So each of these considerations helped us to um, then start to narrow down which of these did we feel uh, most um, met the needs of, of all of our constituents the best. And um, each subgroup what kind of went back then to our buildings, each building-based team met and discussed and debated um, pretty exhaustively where we wanted to cast our votes and what we were able to determine. Um, and we really looked at this as an SAU-wide perspective. So looked at it as a pre-K through 12 system, not, well, this would be better for this building or better for this building, but really meeting the needs of all of our students across the whole district. Um, and then there's a lot of room to differentiate and um, meet the needs of, of each developmental level of our, of our children within that. So these were the four modalities that had the highest number of votes. Um, and we'll present these to you in a little bit more detail coming up. We, we broke these down into the pros and cons and some different categories for consideration. Um, the, the options really vary from um, a full in-person experience to a full remote experience and that hybrid option in between. So um, we're looking forward to some feedback on each of these um, this evening. So I'm gonna let Anna present our first option. And I, I will say that our options aren't presented in a preference order or anything like that. They're presented more on the range of the spectrum um, from full in school to full remote. So again, when we uh, met it as a committee for each of the options, um, when we did our pros and cons, we, we put them in four categories. And again, this is um, kind of going on some of the information that we're hearing from the state task force and what people are, are doing, um, kind of categorizing. So one is instruction, two is wellness, three is facilities, and four is transportation. So for each of the four, we are gonna present uh, pros and cons that way. As Bethany already said, uh, these are not exhaustive lists. Uh, there will be a deeper dive once we get further direction uh, from the committee uh, for the viable options and are, are, are we on the right path? And then uh, we will dive uh, deeper into that. And again, we don't wanna go over every single bullet point for pros and cons. Um, but, you know, for each of the four, just highlighting uh, a few of those. And obviously with a full in-school, um, you know, it allows an in-person instruction for the majority of students. And something that keeps being brought up, um, you know, under the wellness category, this it allows us to help support the social emotional well-being of uh, adolescents. Uh, creates our uh, sense of community and connectedness. And Shannon, one of your top ones, it supports families at the need that uh, being able to go back to work. Um, and cons, <laughs> Shannon, I would go back to you too with the cons, social distancing, uh, not truly possible, but some mitigating uh, steps to be able to take forward. Um, and, you know, down under transportation with some of the guidelines from the CDC, uh, is it possible, uh, you know, with the busing, what kind of increased cost and numbers of buses uh, would this mean? And uh, there, there's potentially some restrictions that we're hearing around buses. So again, just a couple of quick uh, uh, 
highlights from the pros and cons. Uh, Bethany's has the next. So next, um, we looked at a, a more of a hybrid modality. Um, so this would essentially have the number of students in our buildings at any one time. So if you were in group one, you would have in-person instruction on Monday and Tuesday. Um, Wednesday would be a flex PD day. And then Thursday and Friday, um, you would have remote instruction. Group two would be the inverse of this, start Monday and Tuesday with remote instruction, Wednesday flex and Thursday, Friday in-person instruction. Um, one of the highlights of, of this model is that there were consistent instruction blocks um, for students having those two kind of back-to-back -back days of in-person and then two days of perhaps doing more project-based learning or, or um, more independent work during um, the remote. Um, that, that flex day, and it might be Wednesday, it might be a different day, but allowed opportunity to continue to train and work with teachers about best practice so that we can make sure that the, what we're delivering is really the best that we're capable of, um, but also allows for increased um, cleaning and disinfecting of the school. So instead of having to do it um, repeatedly through the day, really allows um, um, between groups of students, rather, you, you, you could do a really deep, you could do cleaning and disinfecting every day and then really deep cleaning and disinfecting on um, that Wednesday between groups of students. Um, there are some challenges for sure in this and just to highlight a couple of them, um, you know, and as you get into the older grade level, um, we may lose some of our electives or, um, or classes that have mixed age groups depending on how, what, how do the logistics work out of splitting these groups up. Um, we need to plan support for families to try and make sure that groups of students, if you have multiple students um, in the district, that they're going on the same schedule and that family support would still need to take place on those remote days. Um, so it definitely was the middle ground between being remote and being in person. Um, some, some definite positives to this, but also some challenges that are, are, would require us to take a deeper dive into the logistics. Um, if this is a model that the, the committee wants us to dive uh, more deeply into. So next up is full remote until X day. Um, again, if we use um, uh, October 31st, it doesn't matter um, what that day is. And then we go to a hybrid model based on the data. So again, could be full remote with um, parent opt in for uh, remote options. So, you know, right off, if this, uh, we knew this were to happen, we already have lived through the remote option. Um, a pro, this would definitely give us uh, time as a committee, time as a community, if that's what we felt like we needed in order to be best prepared for uh, what the state and national uh, uh, guidelines and experts are saying uh, about uh, safety in our facilities. Um, uh, definitely, again, it would allow us uh, time for professional development and taking a look at, I believe, the word that somebody used to have a more robust um, uh, remote learning uh, opportunity. So it would allow us um, that time to be able to plan more with teachers. And if we were still full remote, uh, we still believe that there's options for uh, small groups still to be able to um, be addressed with some of our uh, more intense needs uh, for those students. Some cons, uh, things that um, Shannon, I think um, your group had, had talked about at some length, uh, many students struggled in remote learning and uh, the fidelity of uh, those groups and those that struggled. It still brings into account the child care issue with parents and uh, the data that Adam is sharing from parents uh, about uh, wanting to get students back. And then again, um, supporting adolescents with SEL and social emotional needs of being connected with uh, the staff and other students. Um, the fourth modality, you're gonna see a lot of commonality with the one Anna just spoke of. And, and there is overlap and possibilities to merge lots of these different modalities we looked at. Um, we want to be really transparent in our communication and show you all of our thought process. So this is by no means a final product. And um, there are definitely ways to take the best of some of these different options and merge them together. This is one example of that. So um, in this example, we'd be fully remote and that would be the default. Um, but we would also offer in-person instruction to smaller subgroups. 
So this would allow us to pull in small groups of students that um, would support social distancing um, because we're talking about small groups and not um, the entire student population. So instruction that's most difficult to deliver remotely could be done in person in those small subgroups. Um, this could support both academics, um, special education, social emotional well-being, um, intervention, support, are, are really quite the gamut of different um, needs based on small groups. Um, the challenge with this would be transportation. So how do we schedule um, these different diverse groups of students to come in at certain times? What does that look like in terms of transportation? Um, also in, you know, one of our things was in equity. That was one of our guiding principles. And, you know, how do we create effective um, determination criteria, which says these are the groups that will come in and access, but these groups won't. And how do we create um, kind of an equitable experience across the board based on what each student needs, um, which may be different from, from other students or other peers. Um, so coordinating those pieces and really trying to provide that, that equity of experience are, are a couple of challenges we'd face. Uh, and again, I think it's important to point out that none of our cons are, um, are insurmountable. Um, a lot of these pieces, once we dive into the logistics, if it's um, a modality that the task force is interested in us pursuing more deeply, um, the logistics will flush out some of those those deeper questions that we might have. But again, we really wanted to present kind of the four big picture pieces for everybody to consider um, and, and gather some feedback on. So are we on the right course? Um, and what questions do you have of us? Thank you for that, Anna. So I'll open up. I'm sure we have uh, several questions of the group. Uh, the, the two questions that I'd like us to, to try to frame today, in addition to questions about the specific uh, modalities that they presented, are around the early open of school and whether that can be eliminated as an option for this year, and then whether we have the right, uh, whether they've investigated all the options they should investigate, and if not, which one should they investigate, and then uh, we can go from there. But, uh, so initial questions for clarification from Adam, Bethany. Adam. I would say that we can also, um, when you want to discuss the early start, um, we do have a slide of pros and cons for that if you want us to pull it up from the administrative perspective. Yeah, that may, may not be necessary, but uh, okay. so clarification questions from the group about uh, their work uh, before we get into the specifics of any one option. Shannon. Um, not so much a clarification question, but just a, um, a parent perspective that was mentioned several times that I didn't hit in the slide. Um, there was a lot of concern um, over how do you build meaningful and trusting relationships with teachers that you've never met. So it, if we had to do the option of, you know, full remote from day one, that yeah. was voiced um, numerous times um, that, you know, part of what worked in the spring was that we already had established relationships. So. So uh, am I allowed to answer? Adam? Feel free. <laughs> so I, I, I think too that that would be something to go back into the logistics of things and our youngest of learners, if we were to start fully remote, would we have to look at some things differently, you know, because of the, uh, those relationships. So that, that's something that's already um, things that we have been thinking about. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, I just want to echo exactly what Shannon said, because that also, that very issue came up in the uh, administration, or I'm sorry, the, um, the, the faculty group uh, about, you know, trying to create those deep personal relationships with people that you've never met. So whatever we do, if that's uh, going to be the plan, we definitely want to have a, um, a really good sound plan in place. So faculty members and, and students can you know, have some type of uh, connection before day one happens. Other process questions? Peter King. Yeah, I just had a, a question. If in considering all the options, um, what's going to happen in the circumstance of a child um, who has a member of the family who is diagnosed with COVID and obviously the child is out of school for at least, well, for two weeks? Uh, but then it could pass to another family member. So the child could be out for three or four weeks. So I just want to just throw it out to make sure that that is considered when you do the evaluation of the options, that there is a way uh, to preclude a child who may not be ill, yep. 
uh, but cannot attend school for you know possibly four weeks. I just want to make sure that's considered. Yep. Uh, yep, and part of what we're looking at is um, both that for students and also for staff that may become ill um, as well, but also looking at what are the, um, and perhaps Adam can address it more fully if needed, but what are the remote options um, that we are able to offer to families who um, need to take, keep their children home or make that choice? Um, and that will be a whole another set of planning is looking at what, what those options look like um, what that program would look like to support families who need to keep a child home. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, yeah. and I think Great uh, point. Adam, Adam has said it from the beginning that you know there's gotta be a lot of flexibility and flow back and forth because somebody be, can have to go out and come back in and it, you know, it could be different students. So I think having that flexibility and teachers available in that situation. So those are more things that we have to plan more detail about. Okay, um, what I'd like to ask first, because it's the most time pressing question that we have is are we gonna open school early or not? And what I've heard so far is it's probably a pretty good idea in a lot for a lot of reasons, but it's not practical for us to do for this summer, um, given that it's June, I don't know, 18th, 19th, 18th and uh, there's, there's really not time to make that happen. Um, so I want to eliminate that as a as an option unless I'm missing something and someone else has strong feelings that we ought to continue considering that. So I'm just going to ask the group, uh, you can just thumbs up or thumbs down. Is there anybody, if you say thumbs up, you still want to keep talking about starting early for some, some reason. Is there anybody that feels that way at this task force? Okay, hearing none, that's, believe it or not, that's our first step towards solving this riddle, right? We've eliminated an option. Um, so cheers to all of us for that. Um, so next, uh, the admin team uh, did their best to be exhaustive in thinking about the options, but is there another option? If you can go back, Anna, to the, the yeah, thank you. Is there an option that they missed or haven't considered? Uh, and, and don't feel like this is your only chance to figure that out, think about it. There might be something that comes down the pike that one of someone, one of you thinks about between now and say next week, but is there anything that right off the bat sticks out as, you know, why didn't they think about this? Shannon Gascoigne and then Georgia. Nothing that comes to mind as to why they didn't think about this. I do think the options where we're doing something different in the upper grades and, you know, versus the lower grades was, was common in the parent group that it was pretty clear that the needs were were different and the experiences were different um, based on the age of the student. Okay, Georgia and then Jim Manning. Um, this is also like, it, it didn't have to be listed here, but I did just have this idea. I didn't know when the best time to say it was, but um, if we do end up going back in some way um, and we're struggling with the younger kids, maybe having a sick family member or something like that. Um, the kids in the younger grades that might just need some kind of interaction. Um, I was thinking maybe we could like incorporate a mentorship kind of program through um, the older kids in the high school who might have like two free periods, might be able to do a Zoom call with the kids like once a day and um, we do like an art project or something maybe that they're not getting. Um, with remote learning. So that's not necessarily, doesn't have to be listed as an option, but when thinking of options, we always have, we have so many great high schoolers that would be willing to help out in like any way possible. So um, obviously that wasn't able to be incorporated this year with the um, short term. We didn't know what was going on, but um, that might be a good option for next year. Love it. That's a great idea, Georgia. So we'll leave it to you for recruitment. So in the span of high school students, we went from mediocre up to fantastic. Um, in terms of our mentorship program. Jolene, could you help with that too? Um, <laughs> all right, uh, Jim Manning and then George Bauer. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't jump in fast enough, but I might be an N of one here, but I don't know that our subcommittee wants to take opening early off the table right now. And, and I'll tell you why, because if, if we're gonna put students back in the classroom in a confined space, we're gonna to need to do social distancing, right? And so if you need to do social distancing, you may need to expand the footprint of your schools. We're not gonna be able to do that in December. So 
I mean, and, and so I get the point, I'm, that I th point I want to make here is that, and I think everybody needs to consider is that we need to remind ourselves we're in the middle of a global pandemic and that to make this work, we're going to need sacrifices from the entire community, not just the school community. And that might mean opening the school back up again uh, early. And it might mean people having to wear masks when they don't want to wear masks and, and those types of things. I'm not saying that's the answer, but I'm saying to take it off the table now at this stage of the game, I think would be a bad idea. Got it. Even, if, even if we open up one week early, it might be a benefit. Got it. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go to George Bauer and then Shannon after I say something quickly uh, and reply to Jim in that what I, uh, I think you're coming at it from the right scientific basis, but not the right practical basis. I think what you're telling us is that it's very likely we may have to close November, December, you know, Jan like that's, an, that's something that might happen and darn it wouldn't have been great if we had opened early to get more school in before we have to close. And I think what I'm hearing from everyone else besides your subgroup is it's not practical for this summer. And my belief is if this becomes a cyclical thing, we're gonna have to think about it for future summers. Um, I'm trying to summarize everything I've heard from everybody else besides Jim's subgroup, but does anyone else want to weigh in on that before we keep moving on here. Dr. LaBranche. I would concur uh, with what uh, your comments, uh, Adam. And I think that the task force will probably have to keep itself going anyway. I would suspect that this is going to be a, a dynamic organization. And I would suggest that uh, as you as we move into the um, opening of schools come this September, you're going to be looking at the next school year already. And that's where you need can, you can begin to plan in cooperation with uh, Shannon and the parent groups and the student groups and so forth on what that model is going to look like. Is it the old 4515 model or just what's going to be happening by extending the school year? But to make, to make that decision, you better make that decision next week if you're opening up on uh, August 15th. Now, with all due respect, respect, Jim, if you open up a week early, we may pick up four days. Uh, and I, and, and <clears throat> in the uh, total picture, I don't know how significant that is. Yeah, I, I hear you, Dr. LaBranch. I'm just saying that if we take opening up early off the table, it may, what we may end up doing is if we come back and make a recommendation that you have to expand the footprint for the entire semester, it may, it may automatically take some of these other things off the table. I'm not saying it will, I'm just saying it may, right? Agreed. So that's just the reality. Agreed. So, and thank you and, and Dr. LaBranch, just let you guys all know that you're on this task force for a very long time. You didn't realize, so thank you for that. So until the Fed rate raises interest rates, how about we use that as a metric? All right, um, George Bauer, then Shannon Gascoigne. George. Thanks, Adam. Um, so I, I do think there are some other structures to look at other than these 14. Um, you know, I've been working since early February with businesses, um, some of them being essential businesses um, that in, in the pharmaceutical area, they've been wrestling with this exact same problem is how do we stay open? Um, and what type of approaches have they taken? Uh, what type of controls have they put in place? And then with other businesses that are saying, okay, so now we send all these people home, how do we bring them back? Um, and, and can we do that safely? So there are some other models um, that there's experience with, and I think those are worth taking a look at. Uh, and there's one in particular that I will um, spend some time and write it up for you and uh, send it to you so you can take a look at it. The the basic premise that, that I've worked with with all of these clients is that the farther you deviate from the norm, the more risk you're assuming. And those are risks in two respects as far as they're concerned. One is, is their business, their work product, the types of things they're trying to do. And the other is the health risk of the employees. Um, and, it, and you have a lot of advantage to people doing the things that they're accustomed to doing and being able to control them uh, is, is far simpler than saying, we want you to take on a, a completely new paradigm here in terms of work, and we want you to make that work. And that's where the, the risk occurs because of the errors that occur. 
also known as what we did three months ago. Thank you for that, George. But that'd be great for you to send along, along to us. Shannon Gascoigne. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate um, what Jim and, and George have, have both just expressed. I think keeping that lens lens of, you know, the the public health aspect and the fact that we're in a pandemic and sacrifice may be required is really important. Um, I think parents and families are looking for the same things that our students are: clear expectations, um, you know, clear directives, and and, a, and as much advance notice as possible so that they can plan. Um, we did not, I just want to um, share that we did not discuss the option of starting earlier in the parent group. Um, so, you know, for what it's worth, I, I can't provide any insight into how families feel about that other than, you know, my, my own thoughts. So if that's something that we're going to continue uh, considering, um, I would want to, to make certain that we're talking to parents about that. Thank you, Shannon. So it, Back to the question, are, are there any modalities, George has one that he's gonna write up and send to us, are there any other modalities that we've missed in being exhaustive in our search? Okay, I'll ask that question again next week. So after reflection, uh, remind me next week and we'll discuss that uh, as well and we can add George's in. The next question is of the four that the administrative team has widowed down without getting into the specifics of those four options, are those the right four options? Should there be more that are still on the table? Should there be less? It's okay if we're not sure. This is not a, a final decision for us. The next step will be uh, for asking our subgroups to start going deeper with these four options, right? Weighing the, the relative benefits um, costs, uh, pain points associated with each of these four options th so that we can start thinking about creating a, a construct to make a decision, right? So in the, if you think about where we started last week, we don't know what we're doing. Now we've started narrowed it down to we have some idea of what we might be doing in the fall and how we make that decision is by bouncing these ideas off of the different subgroups and finding out what works for as many people as possible. Uh, we know that no one, there's no way for us all to be in agreement on all of these options or on, on the final decision. But if we continue to keep winnowing down uh, and, and evaluating these things, we're, we're going to get a lot closer. So uh, I, I vamped for a minute there to give you time to think. Are these the right four options is still my question. Are there any clarifying questions about these four options that would be helpful? Stephanie, could we see all the other options for what, while we're talking about are these the right four? For me, it would be helpful to see the other ones up there as well, just to process that a little bit. Thank you. Here, and how about I do this? Okay. Uh yeah, um, so I sat on the, the parent and community members task uh, um, calls, and I'm basically a community member because my kids are not in the school. So I was in the, the full listen mode, and I heard a lot of, um, it seemed like there was a commonality that the high school students did okay with remote, uh, but it was disastrous on the younger grades. So I'm curious, as and I see some of the options considered different learning options for the younger kids versus the older kids. And I'm wondering why um, those were eliminated. For example, kindergarten, first grade, I don't, it, it, the, the sentiment was, it just doesn't work. You can't put a kindergartner on Zoom and expect to, them to get anything out of it. So that was a question I have is why they were eliminated. Bethany. It, if I can address that. Um, I think that within any one of these four we present, it will look different in each building based on the developmental needs of each of each student. So um, there is still flexibility to do different things from kindergarten to high school within these options. Um, but overall, the 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 I, I think part of the larger sentiment from the leadership groups at each of the buildings. Um, was that um, having a chance for touch points more in person 
for all students, including high school students, was part of what we saw in the community surveys. And so wanted to, uh, we're reluctant to put that forth as one of our top options where that wasn't really, um, wasn't really reflective of some of the community data as well and, and parent needs. Doesn't mean it's off the table and doesn't mean it can't be incorporated in, but that I think if I can speak for each of the buildings um, and how they voted, I think that was the part of the consensus of it. Anna, if you want to jump in at all. Yeah, and absolutely. And as you can see, the three of the, the four that we have on the table, there there is that opportunity for in-person. And that's, you know, you're correct, Peter. I, obviously, um, we're looking to get face-to-face -face, um, with, with the students. Um, and, um, you know, remote learning, though, uh, the kindergarten and first grade teachers and preschool did a fabulous job. Um, you know, it is, it is um, there it does offer challenge challenges, but all of those up there, three of the four have the option for in person. All right, Katie, we're going to keep moving on questions, Bethany. So Katie, then Stephen, then Shannon Gascoigne, then Amy Facey. <laughs> all right, Katie. So oh, Adam, this is more of just a, a notice than a question, but um, Bethany, if you go back to the slide that had like your the top four that you narrowed it down to, can you do that? Yeah, perfect. So I just wanted to point out that two of the models that you have here, it's more of like a hybrid model, right? The, the AB two days and then um, the full remote with in-person subgroups. Just one of the things that came to my mind was for staff members, um, if they have young children at home, it just makes it a little bit tricky. Like if, if I'm in school all the days, but like my second grader is only in school two days. So it just kind of becomes a childcare issue. Yeah. Um, also with the in-person subgroups, if um, a staff member is going into school, but their own second grader is at home, um, that causes some, some sticky situations for staff too. Yeah, yeah. We have a very high percentage of our staff live in town. We know that for sure. That's a good so idea. as we would go back to this, Katie, too, those are some of the like really diving deep into like we touched on surface. Like this would be an issue, you know, in parent child care or trying to logistically worry about transportation. But if these become the four, we can go even further, like you're saying, into each to, to list out every uh, issue and concern and positive coming out of each. Cool. All right, Stephen, Shannon, Amy, Stephen. So I know we have uh, 12 minutes left, so I want to go ahead and be very quick. Um, Anna and Bethany, did you guys discuss at all about, uh, you know, obviously the differences between, let's say, the Mount Vernon Village School and Clark Wilkins in terms of capacity, student to teacher ratio? You know, if we go to an A-B schedule, we're going to end up in a day with, you know, seven kids in class or eight kids in, 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 in class. And, you know, that clearly is is awesome from a, a student's perspective, but it's a nightmare from a teacher standpoint of trying to teach such a small group or, or subset. The second idea was, is, you know, I know we visited this in the past and had some negative feedback in one community versus the other about the potential tuitioning of students to create excess capacity over at the Clark Wilkins School uh, and bringing those kids up to Mount Vernon. That's something that we definitely might want to re-engage folks and see if there was anybody that was open uh, to, to that side. So 11 minutes, I'll shut up. <laughs> That's a fair point and a good note to add. Yep, uh, yeah. Shannon, Shannon Gascoigne. Yep, thanks. Um, so on the, the AB schedule, we, we didn't dive super deep into it, but it definitely was going to be uh, a challenge for folks with, um, like Katie said, you know, if I'm working and I might, you know, how do I, how do I make that happen? Um, it was, I had suggested that, you know, do we, at what point do we do a census of our school community to figure out, you know, how many people will be working, how many people um, could do full in-person remote, like, you know, where, when, at what point do we get a handle on that? So that as we talk about these possibilities, we have an idea of what numbers will actually be in the buildings. Right, so if we're offering full in-person with remote parent opt-in, what percentage of our student body is going to be remote and how much space does that give us to work with in the buildings? Yeah, that, that's that's a, a scary numbers game in a way. Um, yeah. And I, I've already heard some states have made that decision that you can choose to be in or out, but once you choose one, you're in through the semester. Um, but that's, I, ho hoping, threading that needle will not be easy. Uh, I agree as we get down the road there. So. Uh, Amy Facey, then Deanna, and then Mike Berry. 
Yeah, just real quick, um, I, I do want to caution against the temptation to think that um, high school students have um, should be considered for remote um, more prevalent than younger students. While perhaps there are some advantages to being older, I think that um, rigor is a challenge. Um, there are um, in-person labs that need to happen. Um, I watched my own college students um, struggle having to do remote, so um, high school is even more challenging. So I just I, I just want to caution against sort of thinking that that you know the older kids um, will be able to handle it. So I just I, I don't want to lose lose sight of that. Thanks, Amy. Deanna Quartz, and then Mike Berry. Um, Deanna, we're not hearing you very well. On the assumption that you're not driving the vehicle, perhaps move a little closer. Okay, very good. Sorry about that. Um, Mike Berry. Yeah, uh, a common theme that I'm hearing through uh, conversations in, in the district, um, I, I was 36 and at the state level, is this idea of grappling with trying to keep it like a K-12, you know, one you know, one model. And even like in 39, some of the conversations I heard on these Zooms and in the panel when I was working with the admin, you know, you have people who, families who wanted the same schedule for the, the their younger kids and they want the same schedule for the older kids, but then you know, it's this kind of balance of what's going to work best for the most people. And I think that's something that this group might want to, you know, grapple with as we move forward, you know, to, to see if do we have to keep it one type of modality or is there some flexibility within it? And then at the end of the day, you know, when people start talking a little bit about making some compromises and sacrifices, there's going to be definitely some, a bit of being uncomfortable for some families as we try to find what works the best for the most kids. And I think trying to narrow that down is something maybe this committee can, can work forward, you know, over the next couple of weeks, but where's people's like breaking points with their, you know, K through six, seventh and eighth, ninth through 12th. And, and as that will help, I at least think could help us inform where we're going a little bit. Cause there is contradicting kind of conversations happening around, you know, unintentionally, of course. I completely agree. The, the most convenient thing and the best thing for families and students is to have full in-person school, right? If that right. was available to us, we wouldn't be having this task force. So uh, we know there's going to be compromise of some kind. Um, Deanna is still working on driving and typing. Um, there it is. Okay. I'm concerned about the elementary students with having specials, going to the bathroom, leaving classes for special support, going to lunch. It'll be difficult for social distancing for these kids and staff. We need to include solutions for this in our plans too. Yeah, yeah, I 100 yeah. percent agree with that. So I'm not, I'm not hearing uh, that we, uh, we know you're the patent. <laughs> Adam, can I? But you're fun to just, tease. Yeah, hands yeah. yeah. free, Anna. Can I just um, and two things, Deanna, that that is part of our pros and cons and uh, things that we would have to look at and more deeply uh, is that piece. Adam, just uh, hearing also. Um, um, for our subgroup, is everybody on the task force, are they feeling A, a B is a, a viable option or is it sounding like we need to take that off, off the list? Can I just ask that question of the well, task force? Well, I, I would say this. Um, I think uh, it would be helpful if your entire slide deck with all of your pros and cons was available on the Trello board to the task force. Yeah. And they all had the opportunity to go through all of the options at their uh, level of depth. They could do only the four you've left on the table or all of them if they'd like to really investigate all of them. Because I think our next step is to go to our subgroups and present in the right uh, context for each subgroup the options you brought forward and the ones that we're highlighting right now and ask the same question I've asked this task force. Are we missing anything? Are these the right options to study? and then start evaluating the pros and cons you guys have already brought forward and going a little bit more deeply into each of those. Um, 
So I, I would hesitate to even take AB off the table right now because that's a pretty popular, I don't want to say popular, but it, it's a common concept that people in the community talk about. And that's a very, in other states and communities are considering that. So I, I wouldn't want to eliminate that too soon, I guess. So a question for the task force as we wrap up, is the right next step for you folks to evaluate these options in detail and then to, then to bounce them off of your subgroups for the purpose of, of gaining further clarity about their viability? Is that the right next step? Bouncing all the options or bouncing the four we've highlighted? Well, I think listing all of them that have been considered and then identifying the four that are, we're highlighting right now and asking some of the same questions I've asked you. Because remember, we want to bring our community along with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, make sure, have we missed something? Okay, and maybe someone will have something that we've missed. If that's not the answer, which you guys are telling me these are the right four for us to be considering right now, then let's start going deeper in those and evaluating the pros and cons that you guys have already started for us. Does that sound like a good next step? Need something in terms of feedback. <laughs> <laughs> There's no room for me to read. So, um, okay, that works. So, uh, if there are no other issues for today, I want to respect everybody's time. What I will do is um, anybody can stay here that would like to answer, help answer some of the questions that are sitting in the Q&A. There's eight open questions, right? Or nine open questions right now. Um, I will stay on and answer the, those questions along with anybody else who wants to stay on with me. Um, otherwise, we'll, uh, you're free to go. Um, I will stop recording this meeting uh, right now.